the senior member of uh, um, E plus three, and uh, he teaches computing and uh, systems engineering at the um, University of Los Andes. I'm Carlos Andres Rosano, I'm professor of the Los Andes University, and first of all, I want to thank LACNIC for inviting us to participate in this initiative of applied uh, research. These are five uh, universities that are starting this process, and today I'm going to tell you about something that we have been t working with for re in recent years. Basically, we had focused on the Internet of Things, as you may see in the presentation, and basically it's because the Internet of Things is a reality. America today. We find the Internet of Things in our personal devices. Many of us must certainly have a smartwatch or a band that uh, gives us biomedical and control uh, signals all that we use for sports or to monitor patients. However, we also have it at home. We also have it at, at home with Alexa connected, and we also have it easily today. It, at uh, Latin American industries. The Internet of Things is not uh, part of the future, but it's already here in our countries. And based on that, we need to start working with it. Certainly, we may have found two types of different implementations of the Internet of Things. The first is more focused on the Internet of Consumption. That is the Internet that we have uh, at home or for our personal use. Now, we're going to find many apps we may have uh, monitoring devices uh, uh, tags here with ipod or things as simple as our watches but we also have home household appliances uh, that are connected not just the tv set but uh, the refrigerator and uh, all uh, the appliances, uh, control temperature, uh, music, and um, background music, many things at home and make our, that make our home smart. But on the other hand, we have the inter industrial internet, and here we have an increasing growth in our region because of many reasons, including the cost for the implementations, but second, because of government policy that let have been taking place in Latin America. In the case of Colombia, in our national development plan, we have a policy of digital transformation. And here, the Internet of Things at industrial level with industry 4.0 is an important component of the country's development. When we look at it globally, we see that this market is really growing at a fast pace. Today, we can see that the market is growing exponentially, and it is expected that by 2028, it may get to a trillion dollars. That's a lot of money invested in an area that is supremely important for the economic development of our countries. So with this as one of the schemes that is growing the most, that we are supporting the most from governments, we start to see the creation of some div divisions. So when we focus on the so-called uh, IoT, uh, consumption IoT, we're going to find things that the current status is new devices, we are generating new standards, that we are working with many new protocols. In addition to Bluetooth, that's one of the most important. We have Segway, our, our connectivity through other communications protocols. Connectivity is seen uh, ad, ad hoc, that is non-structured -stru networks that will enable us, uh, the, the devices to connect upon demand and the uh, they're not too critical. That is the loss of some data or the uh, uh, or if the data arrives late or is not exact, it does not cost too many problems. And finally, the data volume, even though it's a high volume as everything in the Internet of Things, it's not as high as in the industrial Internet of Things. When we start checking the Internet of Things, the industrial Internet of Things, we are going to realize that it's fully connected to connection of machines and machines with the systems, with the services, and with people. Here, there are already quite a few standards. 
com industrial communication standards that are already implemented in many of the industries in of our, of our countries. And in addition, we're going to understand that connectivity of these devices is already structured. We see that most these of these nodes are fixed. They won't move. For instance, we have in an automation company, we may have um, numeric tours or some additional devices connected, so we have fixed nodes, and the, the administration of the network is centralized. So this will cause an, a different need when we implement the Internet of Things. And in addition, something that is supremely important is that these devices have a critical mission because these devices are geared uh, to the core and business of the organization. We are intervening on devices that need to be controlled to generate the products or services in our organization. Therefore, they are quite critical. Here, problems of time, reliability, security, or privacy are absolutely of paramount importance. And the volume of data that we'll have here is very high. That is why we're going to focus, my apologies there, because I think it's the box is not in the right place. So the critical mission, here we're going to focus on two uh, important uh, problems. In addition, in many of the companies that we have visited in our country, in Colombia, the union between these devices that we call operation technology, OT, and their interconnection to the information technology has been done with the traditional architecture. That is, we gradually deploy a number of devices and we connect them to a monitoring and control system that is deployed mainly in the cloud. And here we have two drawbacks. First of all, the latency that this kind of systems may cause. If we make decisions in the cloud and then we process the data, we're going to have to wait for the device to take the information and uh, take it to the cloud, process them there, and then go back to the device. And on the other hand, of course, and my apologies, um, the, the arrows are upside down. We have that devices in the physical layer have a low uh, computation uh, capacity. So we can, we, it would be very costly. Most devices here, we are speaking of very inexpensive uh, cards uh, like uh, that enable us to con connect uh, sensor parameters and to send them through Wi-Fi or any other system to our cloud system. Uh, as you know, they, it has a huge capacity for computations and to have all this logic of uh, the business and uh, centralization of data. So this here we start to see that real time in the IOT systems is um, very important. Basically, the industrial Internet of Things seeks to connect these devices in real time with other machines, with monitoring and performance systems, and with people to make decisions as quickly as possible. And this, depending on the system that I want to get, will generate important pressures in the communication of uh, the communication systems in industry. On the other hand, in many of these devices, we'll have two types of dilemmas. The first has to do with latency for decision making. Basically, it is essential for information to be transmitted as fast as possible to decision makers and may return as brief as soon as possible. And in cloud centralized uh, systems, we will have problems because very certainly our IoT connected systems will generate an additional traffic in our IT systems and they will compete for internet resources. On the other hand, the integrity and reliability of data are paramount in the system. And there it is important to guarantee that the quality of the data be are real because one change in the data may lead to a deficit in the quality of the product or the service. So the first thing that we proposed was in the companies uh, to start working with a distributed IoT architecture so that depending on the size of uh, the 
industry adds one or two layers uh, to the traditional um, system. So there you have uh, the board, the edge layer and the fog layer, two intermediate levels. In the edge layer, we will have be closer to the physical part and we will have a, a storage that is a bit larger than the physical uh, device with a low latency. It will enable us to, to make decisions and the devices will connect faster. In the fog layer, we'll have a local network much better uh, located with an analysis of the data from that we collected from uh, multiple sensors in, and a local storage. And finally, we would have the cloud layer where, again, we would have all the processing of the logic of business. However, these architectures must be adapted to the real need of each of the institutions or each organization. But what we are aiming at here is to improve the latency of responses and obviously to improve the capacities for decision making with computing. So we found two alternatives to the problems we had. The first is latency. Although in the industry systems, we already have some techniques, for instance, a better effort uh, to separate some things. Well, we wanted to explore that is called the time sensitive networking, the TSN, as a standard that was generated from our task force. Uh, 802, 801, and basically the TSN seeks uh, through a number of standards, try to determine some service parameters in a deterministic manner. What does this mean? That what we are going to do is that on top of the existing infrastructure, we are going to maintain some parameters such as a limited latency, a loss of packets, or a low variation in delays. So time sensitive network is pro networking is proposed as one of the first implementations in these uh, um, environments and will what what we are seeking us is to reduce the latency in the transmission why TSN because it enables us to work with three key elements synchronization contracts and interoperability of the system so when we speak of synchronization basically here we assign times of transmission to ensure levels of flowing and latency um, and not all the data that I send uh, have a, a high priority. Some data can be taken uh, every now and then, and there's no problem if it takes a longer time for them to uh, reach uh, the system. But others n need a very short latency. So here we'll adjust the l limits of latency based on uh, what is required by the system we are working with. On the other hand, to do this, we use the contract. And here what we are doing is guaranteeing the levels of service required based on the applications and basically here what we do is we adjust the needs of traffic that we and it will enable us to prioritize traffic we are going to have high priority and low priority traffic and finally tsn will enable us to operate with interoperability with other systems such as best info that will give me a balance in my network so that not all of the traffic be prioritized and that these very strict conditions in a tense time sensitive networking model is not applied to all the packets in the network so, so basically this allows not to send all packets with the same characteristics so within this scheme, we worked with a basic scheme whereby we implemented three scenarios, like the one you're seeing over here, which is an industrial ethernet, a TSNet, TSN on industrial ethernet, and one including a layer in order to do a division. So based on the three scenarios, we did studies cases with low, medium, and high congestion, which you will check in the paper, that reference of which is at the end of the presentation. So what we did is to look at the impact of introducing in our industrial ethernet, TSN, and then 
uh, edge layer on the same scheme. So the first scenario shows the processes. He had high priority processes, low priority processes. We had traffic in some cases which was low, medium and high, and we connected the IoT devices to the services in the data centers, so then we would be able to monitor them and have a baseline in order to carry out comparisons. We later introduced the TSN framework defined by IEEE, and on the same technology we have for industrial Ethernet in order to do testing. The idea was not to do changes in the deployment to really see what was the impact of TCN on the network. And finally, what we did was to do uh, distribution with computing, with edge computing. So here we included some gateways, as you can see on the graph, that centralize information and then have multiple attention points for uh, for the services, for the IoT services. So based on these three schemes, we ran multiple simulations and found three important things. The first is that TCN and Edge technologies allow us to design topologies that are highly efficient to ensure some kind of traffic within our network and will provide reliability to the IoT services for industrial devices. The second object observation was that TCN on its own allows us to ensure important network parameters in critical services in IoT environments. And it's important to bear in mind that many of these services are dealt with in the utility or in smart grids environments and topologies. And this first scheme of the work with TCM, we additionally realized that this can have a negative impact on the low priority services in terms of the topology because most of the resources will be consumed by the high priority services. So when interacting with Edge, we adjusted the deployment topology, we made it much more lightweight, we reduced the bottlenecks and reduced the latency by decreasing the hops. So this is a first approach that shows that TCN is a very good option for the deployment of IoT deployment. We then focused on another important problem, and this is the detection of attacks on the IoT networks. Clearly, this is one of the problems. This was discussed during the, one of the panels. Cybersecurity is a very important topic. This shows the development of attacks until 2022 to IoT systems. If you look at the graph, it is exponentially increasing. These are millions of attacks to IoT systems. By the end of 2022, fourth quarter, we had 12.29 million attacks. So starting in 2018 with 32 million. So what we see is that there is a serious problem here and that security in industrial IoT is becoming much more important for the enterprises. So here basically, and to wrap up, we can say that what we want to do is to protect the devices, the systems and the data from cyber attacks. So basically the problem here is the complexity of including protection systems to devices with low processing capacity and with low battery. So we speak of FED systems because we have devices that will have problems. The lifetime should be longer. And when introducing new security systems, what we are going to include are new apps that consume battery and consume computing resources and affect the core business. So this problem now shows us that the physical devices as such, the network and the software can generate vulnerabilities and increase our surface attack surface in the industrial systems. 
And when we look at the IoT network, we can classify this by layers. There are many classification options by layers. We have three layers, perception, physical, and network and application layers. Each of these has certain features and challenges in terms of security. When we speak about perception, we are referring to the physical layer, to the devices linked to our machines. So the challenges are that if we're going to do this, there should be the technology to be as lightweight as possible. We have to, to protect the data of the sensors. And of course, the challenges are unauthorized access, spoofing, or RF jam. At the same time, when commuting the data, when exiting the hardware and entering the communications layer, we have issues regarding identity authentication or denial of service. Here we can have man in the middle attacks or malicious code injections or DOS attacks, TOS attacks. In the case of application layer, we have privacy, uh, data privacy issues. And of course, these are one of the most complex things that we identified in terms of attacks. In the Internet of Things, the attack surface is very interesting for all these people. So we can have attacks based on the device category or the type of access level, the generated information, if this is based on the type of host and the protocols. So you have devices such as the Clipper that allow you through RF to control, for example, uh, vehicles. So this is an attack based on a specific communications protocol. And if we take this further to a critical layer of the international Internet of Things can generate a lot of inconveniences. So what are we going to propose? We're going to propose a framework that allows us to identify and contain intrusion attacks in the industrial Internet of Things networks. The idea is to use two very interesting types of technologies that are constantly growing. For example, machine learning and blockchain. So through machine learning, we want to do selection and the blockchain to obtain information. And we're going to have a device layer, a node layer, and a cloud layer. In the edge node layer, we can collect all the data generated in the organization in the devices and send them to a machine learning device that has been trained and if there's attack and then attack, we can generate defense using blockchain. In this initial approach we had, the selection of the machine learning algorithm was quite complicated. We have to bear in mind important schemes. One is the execution time, and secondly, the computing efforts required. So these are low capacity computing capacity devices. This is not the same as a cloud computing capacity. So we worked with KNN, which is the one you can find in the paper. Now, over the course of the past years, we have worked with other machine learning algorithms in order to improve the effectiveness of detection and to decrease the response time for these algorithms. And we opted for a lightweight blockchain And the idea was to make this work in the West Bay possible as the technology had been defined. So basically here what we do is that the blockchain is enabled when a security threat is identified and then generates an encrypted response through the use of previously registered keys. So basically what we did after creating the framework was to conduct testing. We use some devices connected to a network. This is, these are the schemes that we use to generate attack nodes with a Kali embedded 
his uh, machine. So he did two important uh, tasks, uh, fuzzing and denial of service, using training data from a university in Australia that is also referred to in the paper. So through this, we detected many results. So it is important to try and understand that machine learning is an important strategy in order to identify potential attacks. However, at this time, we continue to work with supervised machine learning. This means that we need a data set to train these algorithms in most other companies. This is not possible because we need to have labeled traffic and not traffic from one single classification as benign traffic, but as far as possible to detect the type of attack we need to have and to classify this so that it can be learned. And the second point is the use of blockchain, which was quite important. We managed to distinguish uh, malicious traffic because in having predesigned a system that allowed us to do encryption through enabling the collector of the technique, we were able to clearly identify the node that was generating the information or the attack to our network. So as I was saying, it is important to be clear. For example, we used KNN because this classifies multiple classes and allowed us to identify several attacks. Now, at this moment, we're working with a different scheme to have a classifying element to determine whether this is an attack and then to send it to another scheme in order to identify the type of attack. This is in order to reduce the response times because having to select from different classes, you will have to identify from different attacks and we are consuming additional time that we don't have. So this model that we showed you responds very well. It was scalable over time. We could connect more devices. And when we increased the load, it worked quite well. Now, as a final part of this work at the university, we are proposing a collaborative project we are proposing a smart grid of a photovoltaic energy and the idea is to have a space so that the engineering can do all the study of algorithms and decision making and the study of the photovoltaic panels but within that scheme to do communication testing and attacks on real infrastructure and this is because the companies won't allow us to enter an organization and organize ethical hacking on their system. So we're not trying to take this system through a collaboratory in order to obtain better results at this stage. These are the two papers I refer to. The two have been published. And you also have access to my presentation. So this is what we wanted to share with you in the time LACNIC gave us to be with you today. These are my contact details, and we are happy to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Carlos, for your excellent presentation. We have one time for questions. Any questions from remote participants? No questions? Well, Carlos will be around for the rest of the week in case you have any questions. A big round of applause for Carlos. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Gustavo Mercado, who will be speaking about IoT 